Good day, netizens of the jury. For today's, uh, can someone tell me how they let a literal knife-wielding juror into the courthouse? No? So the court officers are just always on break around here or something? Well, threat of dying and whatnot aside, thank you all for being forced to take the time out of your day to listen to my defendant's case. I don't love freedom, no? For today's character court case, I'll be defending my client, or rather clients, the object Pokemon. You all know him or hate him or... Well, I think those are the only two choices after checking the internet. Not really a lot of room for love. <laughs> it's truly sad how bad a rap these Pokemon got, having five GTA stars at all times just by existing. This group of Pokemon undoubtedly has the worst reputation out of all Pokemon to have ever been introduced in the franchise's 28 years of existence. But take a moment to stop molding over a drawing of a trash bag and ask yourself, is it a reputation that matches the offense? Or one that all object Pokemon actually deserve? Cause I don't really remember them pulling an EDP to be so universally detested online. But in all seriousness, if you look at it with a level-headed objective point of view, you'll see that no matter how utterly unimaginative and valueless their detractors make them out to be, this hateful reputation couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, these descriptors are only applicable to the modern day Pokemon designs. But putting that shade I've just thrown aside, allow me to show you today how my clients have actually always been outright amazing Pokemon. From their underlying mythical inspirations to their uniqueness among all monsters in fiction. And you will also come to learn that there is an invaluable creative value to the franchise held only by the misunderstood and unfairly hated on object Pokemon. Yes, they're really that important to the experience the franchise provides as a whole. Now let's put these baseless allegations and overgeneralizations to bed once and for all so that the true value of my clients can finally be seen and appreciated by the world. But first, make sure to render your verdict on this case and tell me what defamed childhood character I should defend next in the comment section below right after this case is closed. Also subscribe to watch the upcoming cases currently on the character court docket as those will be coming to the channel very soon. I don't want to be that TV guy, but working on these cases takes a hell of a lot of time for one guy learning on the fly. Or a uh, TV guy thing. The fuck is that? So like, subscribe, comment, and share would go a long way to making the production time and production value of these cases so much faster and better. Ha ha ha. Hell of a time you've chosen to advertise your channel since you're defending the most lazy and uncreative group in all of Pokemon. So tell us, how little brain cells does it take to defend the Pokemon group that's literally just taking any random object and giving it a face? OBJECTION! Wow, that's really your, uh... Actual voice? That voice of yours really leaves no room for doubt as to your NPC nature, huh, Internet Hate Mob? Anyway, a lack of creativity is the last thing object Pokemon are lacking. And to find out why, let's start unpacking the creativity behind object Pokemon with a strange little word in Tsukumogami. I may as well have prattled off a random gene or protein in the body to you with that confused look you're all giving me. Why that word exactly? Well in order to discuss the fascinating creative concept behind object Pokemon, we'll have to talk about their rich cultural origins, that being the class of yokai known as Tsukumogami. I see it might be making sense to some jurors on the bench now that I mentioned the word yokai. This makes sense as yokai is a more widespread Japanese term on account of it greatly influencing popular culture and notable media therein that we've all enjoyed like Pokemon and these other amazing games and anime titles on the screen here. For those jurors who don't know, yokai is a broad catch-all term for strange supernatural creatures, entities, monsters, animals, spirits, gods, and phenomena in Japanese folklore. Anything from the familiar ghosts and demons, to the more unique Japanese contrivances like the nine-tailed fox and tanuki all fall under this classification. And also this yokai that's never caught off guard in prison, which I dubbed the Cheeklops. Yes, that's an eyeball. Yes, it's in between his cheeks. I had to learn about it, so now you do too. So in short, yokai is a vague catch-all term in Japanese folklore for the supernatural forces of our world, and there isn't an exact counterpart in our English language, so we use the loan word itself like we do wasabi, teriyaki, sushi, dojo, katana, and samurai. With that in mind, we can now answer the jurors that are asking themselves the question, What the hell is even- Tsukumagami. Well, 
Tsukumogami are another fascinating contrivance of Japanese folklore, like the nine-tailed fox and the tanuki. Tsukumogami themselves are essentially a specific type of yokai, and they're the broad classification of yokai itself. It describes household tools that have spontaneously acquired a kami, or spirit, and now gotta make peace with the purpose they were devised for. They're essentially living tools that are on some handy manny shit, and their name, meaning tool kami, even reflects this. The general consensus with them is that they're the result of virtually any object that serves their owner for 100 years acquiring a spirit or a kami, and thus becomes alive and self-aware. Which makes me think, what retired Japanese man was wearing the same straw flip-flops every single day since kindergarten about thinking of changing them once? And that the real monstrous terror to behold ain't the sandal yokai, but rather seeing what his feet look like. And any object really means anything. You might have thought Pokemon was exhibiting artistic laziness all along in turning seemingly random objects into an object Pokemon, but like I made mention of before, Japanese Tsukumogami folklore was really replete with animate objects being virtually anything inanimate reaching 100 years in age. From futon beds, to straw sandals, to lanterns, to one-legged parasols, to brooms, to backpacks, to can you tell I get paid by the hour while you all are lamenting on the bench over this being how you're forced to spend your Friday? Anyway, by now it starts to make sense, no? Pokemon comes from Japan, where things like living beds, parasols, and lanterns exist as Tsukumogami. Game Freak isn't just winging it in the design department by giving common household appliances smiley faces, thus making profitable monsters for money, but rather deriving inspiration from their storied culture and folklore dating back to the Japanese Middle Ages, where people were turning common household appliances into monsters for religion. And we know this to be the case because this is a well-established design philosophy of Nintendo and Game Freak, heavily centered around and drawing from Japanese culture and religion to imbue a distinct and unmistakable charm and identity to all their franchises' characters. In Pokemon, we've seen it from the very beginning with Kanto Pokemon like Ninetales the Ninetailed Fox, Meowth the Maneki Neko, Executor the Jin Menju, and Drowsy the Baku. And across all other Nintendo games, we got so much more with characters like Mario's main villain Bowser himself being inspired by the Ox King, Tanuki Mario, his Super Leaf, and his Bodhisattva statue, and also Gyroids and Tom Nook from Animal Crossing. But it doesn't just end that Game Freak putting a little more thought and creativity into their monsters when designing the first 151. By choosing to draw inspiration from their Japanese yokai mythology, we not only receive nuanced Pokemon that are rich with cultural significance, but we are also treated to novel and creative creatures with novel physiology, lore, and powers. In that way, their creativity allows them to stand out just that much more internationally, and especially their western audiences, which have been used to the same stock monsters appearing on their screens for decades. A very welcome breath of fresh air to the western monsters in our popular culture, like vampires, werewolves, frankensteins, demons, dragons, goblins, ghosts, trolls, zombies, and so many others. That's right western creators, keep your homoerotic vampires and werewolves to yourselves, because I want me nothing but the possessed thimbles and coffee makers from now on. Now for the final point, let's briefly put concept aside and look at my clients design wise. And when we do, you will see that the broad brush allegations of this group being lazy and uncreative falls flat immediately and had no legs to stand on in the first place. This is because what you'll immediately see is just how many creative, iconic, and top tier quality designs have come out of this group alone since the franchise is very beginning. So with that all said, we can do away with the first basis allegation that the object Pokemon group is outright uncreative and lazy. Take that! Oh yeah? Well object Pokemon don't even look like Pokemon anyway. What do they even have in common with Charizard, Pikachu and DB anyway? OBJECTION! Now, to dispel the next defamatory smear against my clients, I think the best place to begin on this subject is by reminding people of the fact Pokemon is a portmanteau of pocket monsters and not pocket animals. Monster is a descriptory term that's even more broad than yokai, encompassing anything from ancient clay golems, treasure chest mimics from D&D, blobs of grime and slime, ghastly spirits, the houses, the tongue monsters that are a girl's best friend, even literal shit, to... Okay. Look bro, don't make me go through all the 9 infinite possibilities and just agree with me here. If it ain't a real life plant, animal, fungi, or microbe, that shit falls within the realm of monsters. Yes, that too can be considered a monster. Damn, maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to stop listening to possibilities. But just how is it possible for anyone in their right mind to complain about object Pokemon not being monsters on account of being unlike the poster child animal Pokemon, when that's never been the only shape and size monsters coming? To specifically take issue with amorphous object Pokemon like Muck, 
and say they are lazy or uncreative is intellectually dishonest. Amorphous blobs with faces are beloved mainstays of monster design, such as the slimes from Dragon Quest, Minecraft, and even other Pokemon that escape scrutiny like Ditto or Solosis. And an even greater showing of intellectual dishonesty is taking issue with objects with faces being monsters, when at the same time, there exists well-known and very beloved monsters of that very kind in Super Mario Bros, Dragon Quest, D&D, and many other big franchises. I mean, some of these are virtually unchanged from the inanimate objects they are based on, or just the object itself. So tell me again how you in your right mind can say that objects can't be monsters. It's really just another preposterous claim that only serves to unfairly defame my clients. And finally, it's not possible for people to take issue with object Pokemon being non-animal in origin, when Pokemon themselves have clearly come in all shapes and sizes since the very beginning, which includes objects. Yes. Object Pokemon are most definitely Pokemon, just as much as the Pikachus and Eevees, because they were always with us since the very first generation, setting the very standard of what Pokemon could be. If you weren't aware of this fact, just take a look at Magnemite, Magneton, Geodude, Graveler, Grimer, and Muck, and you'll see this was always the case. However, for the purposes of this case, I want to spotlight a well-known and Gen 1 object Pokemon as the primary example. So let's first start by taking a look at Voltorb. Voltorb is the ball Pokemon. It looks like Game Freak had that one employee who procrastinated until the deadline, just said let's take a Pokeball and slap eyes on it, and thanked God Almighty when people actually liked it and his ass wasn't out of a job. Now you're probably wondering right now about how our little friend Voltorb is important enough for me to draw all your attention to it. Well, what many of you jurors on the bench don't know is that the Kanto Pokemon Voltorb is the very first Tsukumagami inspired object Pokemon. If we take a look at Voltorb's entries in the Pokédex, such as these entries that are now on your screen, we can see that Voltorb is an example of an inanimate object, that being a Pokéball, coming to life. The Pokédex goes on to further explain that Voltorbs are believed to be born from Pokéballs that receive a sudden surge in energy, which pleasantly provides us with the source of both its electromagnetic powers and explosive nature. It's also a neat idea taking the most iconic and essential item in the franchise and turning it into both a Tsukumagami monster and the series very own Mimic monster like the Mimic from D&D. In that way, object Pokémon give us a novel monster with mysterious lore, unnatural origins as opposed to most other biological Pokémon, a creative technology technological connection and composition, and finally, an immersive and atmospheric experience for us all within the Pokemon world. It's for all these aforementioned reasons that object Pokemon are just as much deserving of the pocket monster name as all the rest, and have been as much Pokemon all along as the organic rodents, furry wolves, and dragons which fanatics lavish inordinate amounts of adulation onto. Take that! Oh please. Spare us the lecture already, bitch head, my boy. Just put all these Pokemon next to the good beast Pokemon like Garchomp and Tyranitar, and anyone with two eyes can see that they're boo -oo -oo -ring. OBJECTION! Actually, the exact opposite is the case. Pokemon would be boring without inanimate Pokemon. And when stood next to them, both the living and non-living Pokemon, as well as the franchise itself, are all able to stand out more effectively. First of all, let's finally get the allegation of object Pokemon being nothing but boring designs out of the way. Without object Pokemon, you wouldn't have the iconic and modern greats like the Voltorb line, Magnazone line, Geodude and Graveler, Muck line, Banette line, Rotom Forms, Bronzong line, Rifble line, Chandelure line, Kafagrigus line, and the Aegislash line. These designs obviously stand on their own as exemplary creative designs and concepts, as well as pillars of the Pokemon franchise. There's also the unfortunate issue that simplicity is fallaciously equated to boringness. Brevity is the soul of wit, a proverb that extends even to creative design. You can see this is a general design philosophy in Pokemon that is exemplified by even the most well-known Pokemon like Pikachu, Eevee, Psyduck, Charizard, Gengar, Dragonite, Snorlax, Ditto, Mew, and Mewtwo. And certain Pokemon are also going to end up being simpler owing to the source of their inspiration. For example, Muck is simple, but so are all blob and slime monsters on account of their slime blob nature. However, in addition to this simplistic design, Muck creatively turns slime monsters on their head by turning slime into a biohazardous sludge with a ghastly violet coloration, a sickly drooping and contorted visage, and a pair of arms unstably rising up and taking shape from the massive sludge. Same goes for Geodude, 
Jude, Driftblum, Aegislash, Rotom, and Banette, who all stem from simple objects and yet incorporate secondary elements to their object morphologies to have their designs be creatively built upon and enhanced. Okay, now going back to the original point, object Pokemon make Pokemon less boring. How? But like I said before, Game Freak taking inspiration from Japanese yokai mythology gives us Pokemon that are not only richly nuanced with cultural meaning, but also a menagerie of monsters with entirely novel and creative morphologies, lore, and abilities. Object Pokemon help the series stand out more than normal yokai inspired Pokemon because these Tsukumagami inspired monsters revolve around inanimate objects possessing unnatural origins and morphologies that are entirely impossible in our world. Object Pokemon serve to break the mold of orthodox bestial monsters exceptionally well, which is a delightful case of irony seeing as many objects are made from molds. Without object Pokemon, Pokemon are tenuously monsters with only biological creatures that mostly resemble animals. Object Pokemon bolster that tenuous connection into one that is manifest and manifold. Remember, the franchise is called Pocket Monsters for a reason. Object Pokemon are a great group of creatures that make the world fantastical as a complement to its biological monsters, which lean more so towards reality and orthodox monsters design. Object Pokemon serve to heighten our sense of wonder and adventure in the Pokemon world, with life we can't experience in our own world or even that of many other fictional franchises, thus irrefutably making their world much more immersive, inimitable, and unique. This manifold breath of monsters, from the living beasts to the mundane inanimate objects, is the breath of fresh air through which Pokemon offers us a multifarious monster taming experience where the sky is the limit as to what we'll encounter behind every bush and eventually befriend, thus successfully keeping keeping us immersed and allowing Pokemon to provide what other franchises hadn't before it. Variety is truly the spice of life, and object Pokemon exemplify this perfectly. Object Pokemon truly do what orthodox beast Pokemon and even normal yokai Pokemon can't, in that their existence brings us a fantastical experience to be had in even the most mundane of objects and settings in the Pokemon world. In this way, these Pokemon are just as much deserving of the Pocket Monster name as all the rest, as they provide the Pokemon experience in their own irreplicable way. Take that! Case closed. Nani? I guess that was to be expected with hate coming from no lives on the internet. Truly a formidable foe. Just give up the act already. The object Pokemon you're defending barely passes monsters and as a result, are the reason Pokemon has been going downhill since the trash bags and ice cream cones started turning the designs gay. Object Pokemon are ruining Pokemon. OBJECTION! First of all, we already know that pinning the entire downfall of the series and its designs on object Pokemon is outright preposterous. It's a tough sell getting people to believe object Pokemon are the very downfall of the same series they've been a staple in since the very first generation and have provided with some of the most unique, iconic, and creative Pokemon and game elements since day one. That's right, Mob. You can't sell the snake oil to the people anymore because the truth about object Pokemon is finally coming to light. This particular cliched smear against my clients is really one of the more absurd because not only does their very presence since day one of the franchise and appreciable value dense forth indicate these farcical aspersions to be just that, farcical, but it also obviously takes a hell of a lot more to bring about a series downward spiral. And I'll talk about that very downward trend right after we delve into how stepping back for a sense of perspective dismantles this defamatory smear. That way, instead of having aggrieved fans pointing at my clients or anything else within the games as the source of all their issues, I can point the people to the real culprit behind the series' perceptible downward trend for a true redress of their grievances. But before that, let's address the elephant in the courtroom. No, not the juror with a knife, which will allow us to then step back for a true sense of perspective on this issue. I know, I know. A lawyer telling the truth sounds like I'm either telling the best joke ever or hell's frozen over. And yet, this entire case I've only been disclosing the truth on all sides, no matter how unsightly. Why? Because only through the truth can we get the true sense of perspective necessary for justice to be served. So let's get at the truth then. Although the usual cliched hate that's thrown around about my clients by the online hate mobs are nothing but over the top hyperbolic smears, this Pokemon group is still not without its own issues. Some object Pokemon are just not creatively reimagined from their inanimate inspirations with secondary elements. And while some of the designs aren't entirely off-putting, they do lose points in creativity and meaning, as their designs are mere facsimiles of man-made inanimate objects and foods with faces scribbled on. You drop the ball 
flaw in creative design if you have a set of keys or a lay itself with nothing more to write home about, but it gets even worse with how lazy and uninspired these modern day object Pokemon are, especially the likes of Stonejourner, Ultigeist, Alcremi, and others. They really give object Pokemon such a bad name. Inanimate objects with no secondary elements are just that, objects. At that point, criticism is valid and welcome. What you want to do is achieve what was done with Pokemon such as Aegislash, Banette, or even Chandelure. If we take a look at Chandelure for example, it is a ghastly chandelier which is an ingenious Tsukumagami, as it is cleverly fitting for the haunted mansions it inhabits due to chandeliers being ever-present centerpieces of these once lavish abodes. On top of that, it sports a grim skull-like face and is then made even more brilliant with its blue and purple flames, evocative of supernatural ghost fires like the Will o' the Wisp or Hitodama. But that's not where the ghastly connection of its flames ends, as there is more to its embers with an underlying creation creative component conceptually. Fire needs fuel, right? The designers had this in mind and endowed Chandelure with a very creative take on this, but just what is the fuel for its fire exactly? Well, we're about to regret contemplating that, because if we were to then check its lore, we would have our blood shilled after uncovering just what exactly the fuel behind their fire is. Its Pokédex entries read, It absorbs a spirit, which it then burns. By waving the flames on its arms, it puts its foes into a hypnotic trance. Being consumed in Chandelure's flames burns up the spirit, leaving the body behind. The spirits burned up in its ominous flame lose their way and wander this world forever. Holy shit does Pokemon deliver on the most terrifying ghosts in all of fiction sometimes, and I am sure that this is a ghost type we can all get behind. Anyway, going back to the object Pokemon that are not creatively reimagined from their inanimate inspirations, this can also stem from the fact that the inanimate objects themselves are difficult to reimagine into a creative creature to begin with. Yes, the concept of Tsukumagami could be any inanimate object, but just as important as that unique underlying concept is having a creatively critical eye as an artist that ensures that not everything leaves the design table safe for concepts and designs of the utmost quality. So if you really feel like you want to make a toilet Pokemon, you better make sure it is the best goddamn toilet monster the world has ever seen. Same for a frickin' lay. Like what the hell is this? It essentially boils down to this Game Freak designers. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Even if broad classifications like monsters, yokai, or Tsukumagami says you in theory can do anything, you really don't have to make everything that qualifies as a Tsukumagami, yokai, or monster into a Pokemon. The only outcome of such excessive oversaturation is turning off your audience and watering down the special quality and legitimacy of these groups, or the original concept therein, akin to the thousand colors and forms of Super Saiyan killing the special meaning, creativity, and legacy of the original Super Saiyan form from Dragon Ball. What's next? Are we gonna have Doormate the doormat and Clippy the toenail clipper next? Or let me guess, a teacup and a muffler? Oh wait, they actually exist. God, I miss old Pokemon. So like I said, this Pokemon group is not without its issues, but those issues exist on the whole for Pokemon. Oversaturation of uninspired half-baked designs and concepts currently flood the marketplace of all Pokemon due to the focus of the company being shifted from creativity to profit. This is why, while there are indeed many insipid inanimate Pokemon, the fact that object Pokemon are ruining the franchise is not only a wholly untrue aspersion cast against my clients, but a wholly unjust one. You know it as well as I that this is far from the only tired or squandered trope in need of criticism. In fact, this is the case for all other Pokemon groups too, and yet they are not outright lambasted with the same vitriolic fervor my clients have to face every day. Game Freak phoning it in has been an ongoing widespread issue that applies to all other Pokemon classifications, but no one else complains in the slightest. So let's finally take a step back by going through some of them in order to truly ascertain the issue in its entirety. Oversaturation of dragons as pseudo-legendaries? I'm looking at you, Gen 5. It should have been me, not him! It's not fair! Oversaturation of the same dragon typing for legendaries? It should have been me! Oversaturation of anthropomorphic humanoid starters? Eco clones? Route 1 birds and mammals, bland animal designs which have the same issue of bland object Pokemon and barely stand out from their animal inspirations, insert ugly ass midget fey like mythical Pokemon with trash designs and concepts, lazy and underwhelming designs and concepts in all of the aforementioned categories as we go on, check 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 check. 
I mean, come on, what's on your screens right now speaks for itself. In spite of all this, pseudo starters, legendaries, mythicals, and all the rest are still beloved Pokemon groups that received endless adulation despite being less special and more uninspired, unimaginative, and underwhelming as time goes on. With all the oversaturation stemming from the same formulaic games being pumped out year by year to meet a corporatist profit-driven agenda in lieu of well thought out and executed passion projects. It's truly important to cover all these other groups to truly get a sense of the scale of the problem to truly know if this issue is being blown out of proportion and when you see that object pokemon as opposed to the biological pokemon now for only an incredibly small fraction of all pokemon you really can see that this problem is indeed blown out of proportion the math adds up guys and what it shows is that object Pokemon are not to blame for this issue, as you've been led to believe. Now, as for who's truly to blame for this all, I think you all have some idea from the multiple call-offs I made throughout this portion of the trial. So let's not beat around the bush anymore, Poke fans. In order to accurately diagnose the main culprit behind Pokemon's acceptable decline in recent years, we'd have to talk briefly about Game Freak's corporatism. Yes, sadly the lifespan of all unending franchises owned by big corporations can seemingly be chalked up to. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Just like with Dragon Ball Pooper, or Star Wars, this is a sad eventual fate of every franchise owned by a soulless big corporation whose only incentive is profit and is wholly detached from the creative product in the form of any passion and attachment. Ruefully, what we've been seeing in Game Freak phoning it in in all metrics of Pokemon's production, which is the most evident symptom with the many uninspired half-baked Pokemon designs and concepts, is just the result of the focus of the company being shifted from creative passion projects to outright profit with the passage of time and control of the series being given to new apathetic and disingenuous leadership, or just corporatist leadership. Game Freak is that big corporation we all picture in our heads but don't want to say it out loud because they gave all of us a very unforgettably special childhood catching and training these unforgettably special creatures. However, we always have to call a spade a spade for things to get better for everyone and Game Freak checks all the boxes of corporatism. Game Freak is a big corporation that always rushes out on their big products to meet impossibly short deadlines or quick cash-ins like Apple and its iPhones. This is because their corporatism prioritizes profit-based short-term metrics such as merchandise sales, flashy gimmicks to dangle in front of our faces, and safe but tired formulas as a red herring to the lack of quality, substance, innovation, and depth they choose to not provide both their fans and the franchise itself with. For those still on the fence, don't change your last name to pool and put on a beanie just yet. Just forget that I'm talking about Game Freak specifically as I lay out all the specifics for you and you tell me if these are not the hallmarks of corporatism and the big corporation. Pushing out cheap flash in the pan gimmicks and the same bare bones formulaic stories in place of novel in-depth gameplay, world building, and stories. Check. Lying to their fans that removing much beloved core features was necessary for higher quality games under their current time constraints when, in reality, it was so that they could cut even more corners and deliver an egregiously underbaked game for a quick cash-in. But with the transition to the Nintendo Switch hardware with its, you know, it's, it being much more powerful, allowing us to be much more expressive with each of the individual Pokemon. And now we're well over 800 uh, Pokemon species in the games. And at Game Freak, we really spent a lot of time thinking about what the best way to move forward was, really preserving the quality of all the different Pokemon, while also, you know, taking into account the battle balance, having so many different Pokemon available, all within, you know, a limited development time, so we don't keep fans waiting too long for every new entry in the series. And after a lot of discussion, we decided to come to kind of a new direction. And so what that means for Pokemon Sword and Shield is that players will be able to transfer their Pokemon from Pokemon Home only if they appear in the Galar region Pokedex. What the fuck? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Check. Keeping an abnormally small development team for a AAA title while foisting the demands of said AAA title and impossibly short deadlines onto them. Check. Lazily reusing the same assets and animations from a handheld game three years prior while lying that both would be brand new because of the aforementioned core features they cut. But with the transition to the Nintendo Switch hardware with its, you know, it's, it being much more powerful, allowing us to be much more expressive with each of the individual Pokemon.
allowing us to be much more expressive with each of the individual Pokemon. Check. Releasing games with very, very hideous graphics and extremely buggy programming on launch, allowing that both would be higher quality because of the aforementioned core features they cut. Check. Imposing impossibly short deadlines on an unreasonably small development team to rush out underbaked source material for the sake of cashing in on the lucrative profit of merchandise primarily, but also all other forms of media. Check. Sounds like a big corporation you hate like EA or Konami, no? And if you switch the words around a little, it also sounds like Apple with their iPhones. Exactly. People, Game Freak doesn't care about its developers, its fans, or our beloved franchise. Game Freak is giving you shittier and shittier games and excusing their laziness and lack of respect for the franchise, its developers, and its loving fan base for the sake of a lazy corporatist cash-in when casual consumers come running back to them. Rather than giving us the respectful fine dining experience with a full nutritious meal, Game Freak is shrinkflating their games like McDonald's as of right now, giving us unhealthy crappy foods and smaller portions at the full cost of a fine dining experience. All the while lying and making excuses to our faces like the soulless corporation they've become. If you want to be mad, be mad at the obvious issue, but not at any Pokemon groups that have existed since day one and brought so much value to our lives since we picked up our first Pokemon title so many years ago. So yes, there's an issue of uninspired designs and oversaturation for object Pokemon. However, the same goes for all Pokemon groups. It still doesn't at all detract from the original concept and value provided to the Pokemon world by this Pokemon group alone. And the only responsible party for Pokemon's decline in quality is the only thing that can affect the entire franchise's production as a whole. That being the soulless corporate leadership at the top of Game Freak that are only concerned with what's in your pockets and not what's in your heart, which is a passionate fan that brought them to where they are and who merits the best AAA monster taming games each and every generation by every and all metrics. And yes, I'll say it, if Game Freak gave a damn about making amazing Pokemon games, how world wouldn't even be a thing. With that gay hate mob out of the way at last, we've officially reached the end of this case. And that means it's time for the brief closing argument, followed by your verdict in the comment section below. So if I could please have your attention. <clears throat> Dear netizens of the jury, with all the facts laid out before you, I'm sure you can now clearly see the great and meaningful value object Pokemon hold. I implore you, if we could all just put down the pitchforks and cliched smears like reasonable, well-meaning adults so that, as opposed to the hate mobs online, you can understand this group for how creative and valuable it truly is and give it the justice it truly deserves when rendering your verdict in the comment section below. Sure, this Pokemon group has fallen on hard times as of late, but so have all Pokemon groups in the franchise as a whole. And with our understanding of the value object Pokemon possess, we should just wish this group the best along with the rest of the game as a whole. Object Pokemon merit it, just like all other Pokemon groups in the franchise as a whole. Because just like all other Pokemon groups, they were instrumental in their own way in bringing us an unforgettably fond and fantastical world, abundant in adventure and wonder. If you have issues with the series and designs of Pokemon and Pokemon groups, take it up with who is truly responsible, Game Freak. Otherwise, let's just wish these Pokemon and the series as a whole the best and appreciate the value held by these Pokemon. Because as we've come to learn, the most profound, indisputable, and irreplaceable value of object Pokemon to the Pokemon universe lies in their very nature as mundane inanimate objects. These often overlooked Pokemon add another dimension of wonder and awe to the least likely of places in the Pokemon world. That is to say, by their mere existence alone, object Pokemon imbue even the static and lifeless non-living side of the Pokemon world with a dynamic source of intrigue and wonder, a side of our reality we tend to likewise overlook and think of only as an afterthought. Thus, the games imbue fantasy and marvel to all levels of the Pokemon world, not just the biological. In this way, the source of fantasy the franchise provides us with is so ubiquitous that the source of awe, amazement, and adventure can be had just about anywhere and everywhere. From an alleyway, to ancient ruins, to abandoned power plants and houses. And this is what's so special about Object Pokemon. Objective faults aside, 
there's a sorely underappreciated and greater objective good to these Pokemon that is fundamental to the very franchise itself. And that's that, from the first time we saw Voltorb, Magnemite, and Geodude as children, the likes of Rotom, Chandelure, and Aegislash as we grew up, these Pokemon have always been a great source of magical fantasy to us all in the most unlikely of settings. Thanks to the world brought about by these Pokemon in concert with all the rest, our journey as Pokemon trainers were an endless experience of pure escapism, adventure, and wonder across all corners of the Pokemon world. Wherefore, we were all treated to a childhood as extraordinarily magical and memorable as it was. Objectively, object Pokemon are great. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to your verdict in the comment section below.